Hey everybody, welcome to another wonderful Talk to Talk, this time with Ann Ferris and Luke Conroy. My name is Ben Glass, you can't see me, but I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm gonna leave my, my camera off due to Berlin internet, but before we begin, before we get to our presentation, I was gonna introduce to anyone who wasn't familiar with our two artists today, our two artists, and um, generally how this goes, it's, it's pretty laid back, but um, afterwards I'm gonna ask a, a couple questions that I have written specifically for the two artists, and then we're gonna like open it up for a, um, yeah, a Q&A session back and forth, discourse and see where it goes. Cool. So uh, Anne Ferris, born in 1988, is an audio visual designer and visual artist working on multidisciplinary projects grounded in research into social subjects. Her projects take form in photography, sound design, film, textile design, and video art installations. Anne's work is frequently site-specific, collaborative, and resonates strongly with the community she works in. Her work often explores the themes of identity, memory, and history. She participates and reflects through her work on socio-ecological subjects to tell stories and to create a role for herself in order to help build vibrant communities and provide a platform for those overlooked. Anne currently lives and works in the Netherlands. And Luke Conroy, born in 1990, is an Australian artist, sociologist, and educator currently also based in, in the Netherlands. His art practice is grounded in social observations and research, taking form in photography, digital art, video, text, and installation. Across his eclectic projects, projects Luke creates satisfying and emotive visuals that promote a consideration of human values, relationships, and beliefs across a variety of contexts. In order to create his, this work, Luke frequently embeds himself in a, in a variety of contrasting working environments, producing work that finds inspiration through collaboration with the local community and his own subjective interpretations. Okay, without further ado, here are your two speakers for today. All righty. Thanks for this. Yeah, thanks for uh, having us, son, and thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, we were going to kind of introduce ourselves at the start, but you did a great job at that, so uh, we won't spend too much time with that. We might just get straight into our presentation today. So uh, like Ben said at the start, we kind of do a lot of different projects. Um, sometimes it's sound, sometimes it's visual arts. Um, it's kind of quite varied, but today we're actually talking about one specific project um, that's called Talk To Me. So we've got a few slides that will go for roughly half an hour. Um, and then we'll take some questions at the end. So we'll just kind of get straight into it, I think. Yep. All right, so hopefully everyone can see this tab fine. All right, so yeah, the project we're going to talk a little bit about today is a sound project called Talk To Me. And Talk To Me is a series of fictional conversations with other than human characters. Um, we've undertaken this project in two locations to date, and we'll be talking um, through our process and ideas about those today. Um, and in these conversations, we're, we're communicating with an other than human character. And in the conversations, they're quite absurd, of course. Um, but we're trying to balance humour in these conversations with also talking about history and um, psychology and philosophy. And I guess our motivation for this project is really just to encourage, um, yeah, broader connections and new relationships with, with the world around us. Um, Previously, a lot of our projects were really social orientated in that we'd um, yeah, go to communities and talk to people. And this was a step in a new direction where we actually expanded what um, communication can mean and, and try to include the, the other than human. Um, but I guess it's really close to our other work in that it's really based on storytelling. <laughs> Yeah, our, uh, the first edition of Talk To Me uh, was held on the Pampas Island. Uh, Pampas is an artificial island in the Netherlands, close to Amsterdam. And we had a great opportunity um, to work with the Climate Museum in the Netherlands. Um, the Climate Museum invited three artists to make a work uh, that was responding uh, to the climate crisis. 
So we'll just talk to you a little bit about sort of our process from the very beginning to the end products and we'll um, yeah, introduce you to the conversations we created um, through the slides. So this is actually the location, Pampas. It was made to kind of defend the Netherlands um, over 100 years ago. It's an artificial island. And this is where the exhibition took place. So there was three artists and they each had a location on this island. Um, and for one month, there was an open air exhibition. Yeah, so the, the island itself is like open, like an open air museum. Um, and like a lot of visitors come there during the summer period to visit the fort. Um, but for us, it was like our challenge to actually add another layer of imagination to the island. So for us, um, yeah, this is how you actually get to the island. You can't walk or drive there. You have to catch a ferry. And so for us, making this um, Talk To Me project on the island, we really wanted to, to, to be site specific and respond to the actual island itself. And so our starting point was actually, this is our first site of the island and we're actually already making notes and observations that later we can build into these um, fictional dialogues that we're creating. Uh, yeah, here you see me uh, sitting on the island, um, writing some notes down. Uh, the first thing we saw, there was a lot of grass, um, but what you not can see in this photo is like, it is of course really, a, it's a beautiful island, uh, it's a beautiful location. And uh, we were actually using our senses to, yeah, just uh, make observations, um, but also what do we hear, what do we smell? and all uh, that kind of stuff. Um, and what you don't see here is that there is actually a generator behind me. So uh, that's the sound you constantly hear in this location. Yeah, so we thought it's quite, um, we, we don't want these audio works to just be a podcast that you can listen to anywhere in the world. We really want it to be site specific. And so actually just sitting on location for us is, is probably the very first starting point. Um, so part of our process is also just <coughs> collecting sounds as well. Um, you can see here we've got our jumpsuits on, which we're also wearing today. Um, and it kind of started as, I'm not sure how it started exactly, but I guess where it ended was um, that we, we noticed that when we wore these suits, we had this presence, this kind of visual presence, which actually invited conversation and um, and invited attention around what we were doing. Yeah, and because audio is not that visual, so we gave it like this visual aspect uh, to our work uh, in this case. Yeah, and it, it just definitely got a lot more people coming and yeah, introducing themselves and being really curious. And that's actually important for our project is talking to people and getting their ideas in our work as well. So the purpose of the suits is to actually, yeah, become visual. Yeah, we had the chance to stay on the island uh, in a tent. Um, this was also because during the day there were a lot of visitors, um, but we also really wanted to know what kind of sounds are there. Um, yeah, what is the situation on the island when there's no one there and uh, also to record like different sounds. So in the morning hours, for example, and the evening hours to get like a total uh, idea of the island. And during the research period, the lead up to the exhibition, where we also ran um, some community um, or visitor workshops where we, um, this one was based on sort of getting in the role of being a blade of grass. And so we took visitors through a series of processes using all the senses to actually think from the perspective of a blade of grass. Um, and so the interactions we had with that fed into our research and our ideas of when we're creating these um, fictional dialogues and these scripts. Yeah, with all the ideas we had and all the topics and we wanted to respond to the climate crisis, we uh, wanted to start uh, writing the scripts and um, we started to look like which characters can fit in and which characters can be interesting. Um, because also the characters uh, together, they make for us like a bigger story. And the scripts are really like a film script. Uh, they always have a beginning, a certain middle and a conclusion. Um, so there's always like a certain conflict or a friction or the discussion. And we also play a role ourselves. So we play the role of an interviewer, um, but this is also fictional. And I think um, 
when we started this project, we really thought that, you know, we were making an interview with an, with a character. But the more we progressed, the more it became more of a focus on conversation in that the works we produce are, yeah, we're having these um, conversations with the grass blade, but it's just as important sort of the role of <clears throat> us as the artist because it's, it's sort of shining a mirror up to ourselves to kind of um, put some, pose some questions back to the, the interviewer. And so I think it's very much a balanced kind of two-way exchange that we try to create. And with all the scripts, we actually go to the studio, to the sound studio. And we always like look um, who is maybe the best to, to play the role of the character that has like certain traits or um, yeah, what kind of traits do the character already have themselves and use that in our scripts. And here you see me recording in the studio. And so these are the three characters that we came up with for the um, first edition of Talk To Me. We had um, Maria, who was a basalt stone, and we had Vicky, who was an elderberry tree, and we had Dario, who was a blade of grass. And they were kind of situated um, across the island, so you could visit them as part of a tour, but it wasn't really that you, there was a certain order that you had to visit them in. Um, you could visit them at any stage, but together it really formed this broader story, which was tackling this issue um, of the, the climate museum, which was, yeah, the, the climate crisis. So what we'll do now is kind of talk to you a little bit more about these characters and what we're trying to get into their stories. Yeah, they're all uh, like audio works. So for us, it is also, um, yeah, really important that the work is actually visible. <laughs> so we came up with like the idea of the poll with a QR code. So that's the way to actually access uh, the audio work. So as I said before, we tried to come up with, with characters that were contrasting each other, that um, when listened to together, they form sort of chapters, I suppose, that build, built this bigger story. Um, so the first character we came up with was Vicky, and she's this elderberry tree that's right on the edge of the island there, and she's kind of filled with all this anxiety and shame because her origin story is she actually got uh, pooped out by a bird um, that ate an elderberry seed somewhere else. And so she's kind of started life with this shame and she can hear the water sort of coming towards her base and she's really anxious. And we thought that's a really good point to actually tackle um, the anxiety around um, climate change and the climate crisis. Um, that's quite a common emotion that a lot of people felt. And so through this conversation, we're talking to an elderberry tree, but... Um, through her, we're actually touching on some anxieties around, um, yeah, the climate crisis. And Vicky's crisis. also referring to her own location, what is, like, situated next to the water. Yeah. And so we had Dario. He was a blade of grass. And so, again, we thought grass was interesting because often there's so much grass as well, but we thought it was interesting just to focus on one blade. And we like the idea that people are sitting on grass. And so there's actually this sort of intimacy with grass. Um, when you sit on it, it, it kind of flattens down. And then when you leave, it comes back again. And so it's got this resilience. And we thought that's actually an interesting way you can actually think about um, the climate crisis that, yeah, you know, things might get you down, but there's always a way forward. And I think that's another way of looking at the climate crisis in that there will be a solution, like we will find something. We're not sure what it is, but there's this sort of optimism. And so through the grass blade, we were able to touch upon some issues like that. And then uh, finally, the third character there we had was Maria, and she's this basalt stone. She's, um, yeah, the, the island is artificial. It's actually made up of stones. So she's one of many that makes the actual island. And we thought Maria was really interesting to talk to because she's got this longer um, sort of perspective on time in that a human perspective's within 100 years, whereas a rock perspective might be thousands. And so Maria is sort of super relaxed and she's got this um, sort of, yeah, idea that, yeah, this is a climate crisis, but there's actually been many climate crises and it's, it's not a big deal and it's sort of kind of turning... Um, the conversation to this longer term, this longer time frame, which we thought was interesting to do. And so together 
those three characters sort of create this story of different ways of looking at the climate crisis and build a picture where we're not really um, giving our opinion as such. I think it's, it's coming at it from different angles and just sort of leaving it there with the listener and they can make of it. Yeah, for us, it's really important to have like all these different angles uh, to kind of uh, fill out this like bigger picture. Um, but it's also important for us to be not educational, but um, that it really stays like humorous, playful, but can be at the same time meaningful. And so this is a installation view of, at the opening of the exhibition. Um, so this is this is quite an interesting experience for us because, yeah, usually I think the average time of looking at a piece of visual art is actually 30 seconds or under, whereas our pieces are about 15 minutes to 20 minutes. And so you've actually got this really engaged audience. And so we could listen to, um, we could watch these people listen to our um, audio and throughout there's moments where we ask the audience to actually pick up some grass and sort of smell it and look around. And so it was really interesting for us to actually see um, this unfolding um, on the location. Yeah, we find that interactive, um, yeah, the, the focus on that interactive um, behavior or um, yeah, that we ask people, invite people to actually interact with uh, in the location, uh, very important. And so this is where Maria was located. So she's a rock that's kind of just under the pole here. And yeah, you can kind of be there and be with Maria. And she talks about the water. She talks about the boats. She talks about what she can see on the horizon. So it's definitely an audio work you can appreciate anywhere. But when you're on that location, it's, it's quite um, participatory and really trying to get an active um, listener. Yeah, then we started the second edition. Uh, that was the beginning of this year uh, at the Heigraaf. Uh, we had a unique chance to stay for three months um, in the residency Recreatie. And Recreatie is a very unique program because they focus on the connection uh, between art and care, um, disability care. And yeah, we had the chance to stay um, in, uh, at the Heigraaf and uh, research and create our project. Talk to me. So this is a photo of the outside. So we were living in the care organization for adults with severe disabilities. Um, and then to the right hand side of this image, you've got a sort of a recreation area. And so they have about four artists each year that come to this residency and each artist works on something quite different, whether it's something for the residents that live there or um, perhaps a sculpture or um, yeah, an, an interactive work. Whereas our aim for this project was to create some audio conversations. And our main aim was really to link the two worlds. Um, we noticed the fence between the inside community and the outside world. And we wanted to kind of actually make this a bit more fluid. Mm -hmm. And this was our, our goal coming into the residency. Uh, so as you can see here in the orange area, this was the um, care organization. We lived um, on the side here. And in this area, you've actually got this small community. There's about 10 different houses. There's a gym. There's um, yeah cafeteria. There's a doctor. There's a workspace. So they're, they're really self-contained. And then outside of this, you've got a forest area where there's lots of people riding bikes and horse riding. You've got a lake here where there's um, people, yeah, sunbaking, swimming, and then you've got camping grounds. And so there's a lot going on, but they're actually really, really separate um, sort of activi activities. And so our main goal with this project this time was actually to create some audio works that would make these borders a bit less noticeable and to create some more awareness around this care um, community that was there. Yeah, we started um, with a lot of like observations, um, like going out uh, in the nature because the work is very site specific, and we wanted to uh, that our characters also respond on uh, yeah on the environment, um, and it's a beautiful environment to have walks and also um, yeah to create a, a better understanding for where it is when you listen to the work. And here um, you see me at the lake recording the sounds. So we find it important to actually make, create a soundscape um, that you really, if you listen to the audio work online, that you really can imagine yourself being there at the Heigraaf. 
Um, here you see, um, yeah, us recording at the lake um, in the nature, um, but also on the terrain itself in the community. And so this is where we're located for three months. This is our work studio. And it was during in the Netherlands when we're in the middle of the lockdown restrictions. And this is obviously a really vulnerable community. So we um, were in this studio really sort of close to the um, yeah, the care organization, but we have we had to have a distance as well. And so our solution for that was to actually sort of have this really visual studio. And of course, again, we're working with sound on our computers. It would be super boring if we're just there typing away on our computers. So we made this choice to actually get our visual journals on the windows so people could actually read it passing by and it was still corona safe, but we could have this sort of dialogue um, indirectly through that. And you can see a close up. And so basically what we're doing here is researching um, in this context. So we're researching about um, yeah, stigma and stereotypes around disability care. We're researching about just this location itself, um, the history of it. And we're grouping together all these ideas and then we're starting to think, all right, what's a good um, object or character that we can actually explore some of these ideas through? And so we're just writing all these um, ideas on the windows and then starting to match idea with the character um, to narrow it down a bit. Yeah, these are the four characters that we chose in the end. Um, and they all kind of have a different role and, and different angle they show us. Uh, we have the, the pine fir, uh, we have the boom gates, uh, we have a mall, and we have the street lights. And so once we chose the, the characters, we then set to writing the script, similar to the last project. And it's again, we're trying to balance, you know, the absurdity of talking to something that doesn't usually talk with actually these kind of um, topics that we find quite interesting and um, serious to talk about. And so we're trying to weave all of that into these conversations. And we definitely, you know, don't want it to be an advertisement for this care organization. And we don't want it to be really in your face educational about disability. We, we want it to be a conversation that subtly there's themes in there that um, are, are interesting around the idea of care yeah, and key, disability. The key for us is really to tell a story and that it can be just also fun and, and, and nice to just listen to this story. And there are like uh, certain elements and there is depth in it, but it's like in the first place, we want people, the listener also to enjoy the story. And this is just some photos of us recording sounds around the care organization. Um, we have to do um, sounds that actually fit the script that we've been writing. So we had a mole that we're interviewing. And so you can see me on the left here, um, sort of doing these digging, um, recording these digging sounds that we can later use in the audio we create. And these are some interactive um, sound sculptures, I guess, on the on the terrain of the care organization for the people that live there. And so we actually got sounds of those as well that we wanted to come back in to really, yeah, connect it to the place that we're, we've, we lived in for three months. Yeah, all these different sounds are coming into um, an edit. And um, yeah, this is an overview of my last edit. Um, so there's this conversation, the folly sounds, um, all kinds of different sounds of the character, but also like people passing by. Um, and then like environment sounds. And the last time we had also um, the chance to work with a composer uh, for the music and that all these layers are coming together to make uh, this conversation. So we'll tell you a bit about the conversations now. We've, we've sort of deliberately not, um, yeah, shown you the audio conversations, the finished products today, because we thought, you know, they're out there and we want you to go and listen to them yourself. And so we thought this is a good chance to actually explain more our motivations. So the first character we created was called Janneke, and she was a boom gate. And we thought she was a really interesting character to actually talk about because she's sort of the, the boundary between the inner care community and the outer world. And so we thought, you know, that's our main motivation. So why don't we actually interview the barrier itself? And so a boom gate can only be shut or open. And so it's really black or white and so in the 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 character we built for Janneke we actually had a really black or white character that 
she sort of just knew everything. We we go through and ask all these questions and she can just say yes or no. She's not indecisive. She's very sure of herself, but she also sort of lacks, um, yeah, personality. A personality or a connection in some way. And so that's actually um, reflective of what we sort of observed um, in the care organisation. And talking for the community, yeah. And so another character was Marco, um, a Douglas fir. And so Marco is this really big tree that's been on the location for about 60 years. And that he's inside the care organisation, but he's really close to the outside. And so we thought we could explore the role of the um, disability care worker through Marco. Um, Marco talks a lot about sort of in interconnection between himself and everything else. Um, he's a really philosophical character. Um, he often gets lost in chains of thought and he's sort of um, realistic in a way. He's, he's really aware of death and dying and he's sort of made peace with it and he just he really talks in a matter-of-fact way um, which is quite confronting for the, the artist, the interviewer, and it kind of reveals some, some interesting ideas there around, yeah, bigger philosophical issues. Yeah, he's now inside the gate, but once he was also outside the gate, so he's sharing yeah. um, his ideas on that. But it's also kind of in a nice, calm uh, environment, actually, like in hidden kind of spots on the terrain itself. Um, so, and he's really responding on the things he's seeing around him. So the nicest is actually to go there and sit there uh, to listen to the conversation. And the third character was Leela. She's a mole. And we, we, we sort of were a bit hesitant to actually create a character around a mole because animals um, are quite familiar to have a talking role in children's books and movies, whereas an, a talking tree or a talking boom gate is less familiar. And so we, we tried not to have an, an animal initially, but we... We thought it was it, there was too much to like about what the mole represents and what you could explore through that character. So we eventually decided to go with it. And through Leela, we explore a lot of stigmas and stereotypes, which is a, a really big um, sort of concept in, in disability because there's all these mole hills everywhere and people have an opinion about moles and people are trying to get rid of moles to move them somewhere else. And how often do you actually see the mole themselves? And so we, re we really like that idea of the mole's this hidden sort of character and the disability care organisation is sort of very present but also hidden as well. And so we're really trying to explore that, that kind of idea through the character of, of Leela. And then the final character was Martine. Uh, he's a streetlight that's on the road outside of the care organisation. And Martin's sort of this character that's got this really big um, sense of self-importance. Uh, he turns on as soon as the sun goes down and he shines his light and his light is very, is literally very narrow. And so we thought that could actually be this sort of um, character that's got this really narrow view on the world and anything that falls outside of his sight is sort of irrelevant or not important or um, stupid in a way. He's more talking from the perspective of an outsider. Yeah, he's definitely sort of the outsider perspective and he's got really strong opinions on what's normal and what's abnormal. Um, for example, he talks about how his light, the white light, is really pure and that's the, the ultimate form of light and any other light is kind of a bit pointless. And so we're not directly touching around um, the disability care context, but there's all these themes that touch upon, yeah, what's normal, what's abnormal, um, which feeds into this larger conversation we're trying to create around disability care. Renata um, um, actually has a broad range of disabilities, people with disabilities, and uh, these guys that you see here uh, are coming every week. They are part of the gardening uh, group program and they're building skills uh, at the Heigraaf and they uh, helped us uh, very much with um, actually planting the poles uh, and the poles are like part of our audio, audio tour. And so this is um, the image file. So similar to our last project, we had a, a wooden pole and then we had these engraved metal plates that have the QR code, a little bit about the project and about the character. So our hope was that if you're just passing by, you might see this, you get a little bit of a taste 
and then that can really be um, encouraging you to take out your phone and and listen to that conversation perhaps by chance and so these polls are going to be on the location for five years um, yeah yeah, here's the the poll that belongs to the Douglas uh, fir um, in this kind of hidden area. And this is another one of the polls. This is near Martin, this the street lamp, and you can see that there's another pole next to him, which is this walking track. And so that was a deliberate choice that we wanted to put those our poles next to a, a recognised pole of the walking track that gets used a lot to hopefully invite. A broader audience in to perhaps be curious about um, this project. Yeah, so the introduction poll is actually on the terrain because for us it's important uh, that that is the starting point of our project. So you get an introduction like how to actually visit the audio tour. Um, yeah, and it's here situated because we hope that actually people uh, then access uh, the terrain and actually have a look and and yeah also have a better understanding for what the Heigraaf actually is. And we also decided to make a map. So this is a visual um, map of where every um, audio location is. And so this is a care organization on the right of the map. And there's three of the conversations you can find in. There. And then two of them, the mole and the, the street lights, are actually outside. And so the idea is that um, through actually listening to organizations, you're having this physical movement between the in, inner and outer um, communities. But also through listening, we're hoping to sort of have this um, yeah, intellectual movement as well, that as you listen to the mole, you're sort of um, getting into the zone and the, the discussion around what is disability what are different ways of looking at it and seeing it and so um yeah that was the goal to try and raise those topics and this map is also uh, we yeah we made it also in in the format of a postcard and we're going to provide them from the summer on and we provide them at the campings around the Heigraaf because there are five campings located there in the recreation area um so that we hope that's the invitation for people to actually go on the audio tour. So we did the first uh, tour um, with a few residents um, and uh, took them on a tour and actually, uh, yeah, showed them uh, the locations and uh, list, we listened uh, to fragments of the work. And so as we said before, we, we try and have multiple access points to the conversations and so a lot of the, the residents that live in this community actually are at an intellectual level of around, yeah, two years old. It's quite low. And so our conversations are at a level that's quite hard for a lot of the residents there to understand. And so I guess our target audience in terms of the content was more the carers and, and actually the family that come to visit the people that live their their relatives that live there because um, they often come on the weekends and after a while you know they've, they've seen all the the things that there are to do and so our our artworks create a, a new reason to actually go out and, and explore the nature around and it's a topic that's they can relate to as well and so i think the access point was more geared towards the carers and the the outside community as well as relatives mm -hmm. but um in this tour we also found that the residents themselves could access it at a certain level as well and found it intriguing that there was this audio that was connected. And so there was definitely a connection there as well. Yeah. For us, it's it's also really about to make connection with uh, people that are coming for all these day walks in this um, super beautiful uh, nature, natural environment, um, but also the town close by, uh, Waldenberg. We really hope it's like an invitation for also people living there and people that just come to visit the camping or in the summer or just the lake um, that they will find the audio tour. And that's just another um, image from the tour we ran at the end where a resident there is looking at the postcard we created and sort of matching what they're looking at on the postcard with where they are and, and the sounds that they're hearing um, as well. And so. After three months, we made um, four conversations plus an introduction. And yeah, it was really just trying to get this flow of people across these previously really separated um, borders. 
and also just raising the topic of um, care and and what and the multiple ways of looking at that. Yeah, this is the end of our presentation. Um, yeah, thanks uh, for the invite, uh, Ben and uh, Antje. And um, yeah, also to be part of this uh, exhibition. Yeah, and, and like I said before, um, yeah, we deliberately didn't show any of the works here. We thought it was a bit pointless just to sit, all sit around and listen to the audio. We thought it was nicer to maybe hear from us and then go and find it later. Um, it's The audio has been recorded in English and Dutch. And then sometimes it was just in Dutch, but we've had audio subtitles. Um, sorry, English subtitles with that as well. So hopefully there's an access point there for everyone. All right. So, yeah, we'll, we'll go to some questions now. Hopefully some people have some questions. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Cheers. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, can, can you hear me all right? Yeah, yeah, perfect. We can, we can oh, hear wonderful. you perfectly. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. So I, I have a couple questions jotted down here um, that I'm going to work from as well here. And um, keeping in, like, I, I saw some of your other work as I was going through your work, um, but I'll try to keep it too relevant to talk to me. Um, so um, many of your works have a focus on social or rather community interaction. Would you consider yourselves to be social practice artists? Uh, yeah, I think, I, I, yeah, well, I wouldn't write that in my uh, artist statement ever, but I think just hearing the question and thinking about it, it's, yeah, like I studied sociology first before visual art and Anna comes from a documentary film background and, and they're, they're kind of inseparable from um, society. And so I think, yeah, it's definitely a, an apt way to describe our practice. Um, as we said at the start, a lot of our projects do try to connect with the community that we're working in. And this was a sort of a sidestep to kind of imagine a different community. But um, I think it's definitely touching on social, social ideas. Yeah, that's for us really, yeah, it's just a really interesting platform uh, for us. And, and yeah, and we find it really interesting to <clears throat> not being like only in the studio, but yeah, really have um, the opportunity to meet new people and also to uh, explore like new ideas. And for us, the way to do that is really, um, yeah, in collaboration with uh, other communities. Cool. And how how do you typically begin a piece? I know you, you talked about your process in, in beginning the, the, the content creation for talking, but how do you usually get your idea? Where is it usually a response to an ecological issue or a special issue that's happening or something that you observe or how how does it begin usually? Yeah, for us it's 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 quite um it's, it varies. I think the nature of yeah the the art world is that often there's an open call and they they sort of give you this prompt of. Um, yeah, a little one line that you then have to create a project around. And so sometimes it's, it's sort of we've got something we're really burning and have this desire to actually work on. And then other times an open call just says one line and then we, we talk about it together and, and sort of come up with an idea that will work. And so, yeah, in this case it was, it was a sound project. Sometimes it's textile work. Sometimes it's um yeah film sometimes it's uh photography so i think we've got that flexibility to respond in in multiple ways yeah what, what is really interesting for uh why audio is interesting for us um is because it's because of the um yeah the, we, we already talked about uh how long you normally look at an artwork that's not that long it's 27.2 seconds um, to be exact. Yeah, to be exact. Um, but with audio, is um, it's a very accessible way. Um, yeah, it's a format to use, and uh, we noticed it's actually um, yeah people have longer attention uh, for for an audio work than for any other work, um, and it's also for us interesting because you. Um, you don't really change too much of the environment. You don't need um, it's 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 mainly like uh, digital, and that's for us also nice that 
Of course, you can invite a lot of artists, for example, to that one residency at the Heigab, and they make fantastic things. But in the end, you have so many works there. And yeah, we find it kind of a nice idea that it also um, stays really digital, that you don't have to change too much the environment for making your work there. Yeah, so I think for just this project, <clears throat> that's where it started for us. It was it was actually just reading an open call and thinking, what can we do that responds to that well? And for us, it was audio kind of came out. And then it was then, yeah, I think, okay, if we're going to do an audio project, what might it be? Um, we go and research a lot. And for us, it really does start a lot with research. And then we see what form it kind of goes to in the end. Yeah, and this project just has it all for us. Like it's and accessible and it's it, it's 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 humorous and it's really about storytelling and you have the yeah well filmmaking is as well but um for us it's yeah it's it's something we feel very comfortable with and um we also really like to work on these pieces nice thank you and my first question is do you consider yourself to be uh, activist? Is your work activist oriented or is it rather just exploration and whatever kind of community building comes out, comes out and you just kind of go with the flow? Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's, I think that's a, an interesting question, but for some reason when I think of activism, uh, yeah, what pops into my head is sort of, yeah, someone holding a sign in a protest saying like, yeah, you know, and end fossil fuel use or something. And it's really direct, this sort of in your face loud. Message, yeah. And that's what I think about as soon as I hear activism. But I, I think activism's got many forms. And, and for us, we're really interested in storytelling. I think if we're an activist, mm -hmm. what we're what we're pushing for is the value of stories and um, or maybe a bit too subtle for it. Yeah, it feels like we're a bit more subtle, but I think it's still, it's it's really pushing that stories are important and they don't have to be really big, grand stories. They can just be personal ones and, and they can be really valuable and meaningful. And so I think the activism across all of our works more that um, it's important to listen to other people or, yeah, made up other than human characters as well. Um, and I think... Yeah, if, if we're activists, I think it's probably just valuing stories. I don't think there's maybe a certain agenda as such that we're really trying to push too much. Yeah, it's really, it is like we really hope to create or have, provide like a certain platform to have like space for discussion or reflection. So we hope that people actually take their time to listen to the works and and actually find things they feel yeah just inspired or um that they reconsider like uh, certain elements or certain themes um just yeah there is this hope maybe the hope for activism there or that people are becoming more aware of of certain things but um yeah maybe it's yeah less um it's a different approach probably yeah yeah nice thank you yeah, it's kind of a difficult question. Sorry, it's really That's a good one. Nice yeah. question. You're killing it. You're really killing it. Um, and my last question is uh, perhaps the best question is: um, Is there anything that's on your plate that you want to tell us about? Kind of tell us to keep our eyes and ears open in the future. Uh, yeah, there is. Um, so we're about to start. Uh, yeah, the new world of online residencies. We're about to start a residency with. Um, yeah, the St. Petersburg Artist Residencies. And so it's a visual art project this time for six weeks. It's all online and it's looking at the the idea of the city. So um, I think starting on Monday next week, we're actually going um, into that with a totally yeah different project to what we're showing today. So that's probably the next thing for us. Yes, and, and yeah, we hope actually um, to work further on Talk To Me because we hope to to find another context uh, to make the work in. Uh, yeah, because I feel like we want to further develop this project. Nice, great. Um, that's that's for me. If anyone else has any other oh, questions? We, we, have, we have an exhibition in October oh, yeah. in Barcelona, which is also an audio project. 
Yes. Yeah. Yes. The other thing. Yeah. For a sense of our city, so um, on our website you can read about, find about it, uh, find more information about it. Yeah. Cool. Sorry to catch up. Sorry to mean to catch up. Um, yeah. If anyone else has any other questions, uh, please shoot from the hip. Yeah. Shoot away. Mm -hmm. Go for it. Hey guys, um, thank you for giving the talk. And I have a question about uh, the the, the, uh, the time you you will come to sites in, in near future, whenever that will happen and, and uh, is matching for you. Uh, because I was uh, thinking about to um, we wanted to ask you to to also do a sound project there. Is that um, Matching two languages, also talking about uh, German. How is how, how do you think um, it would work in, in any other language? Um, because right now you did it in Dutch and English, and um, is it for you accessible um, or uh, and, um, also maybe a nice way to um, to do it uh, in in different languages to do it. Uh, in a different way than you you started with right now. Yeah, we talked about it a lot actually. Um, and the last project we did actually only in Dutch, um, but we found it really important to write both on the script. So we um, did it first in, in English, and then we I translated everything to Dutch. Um, but what you see when you translate things is that you you lose some. Um, jokes, you, you do some, um, yeah, just some, um, yeah, 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 sometimes yeah. work in, in yeah. a certain language and then lost, but then also there come like different things in, in a new language. So that's okay. also really nice to anticipate on, anticipate on like these new um, things you find. Um, and we actually think it can work in a different language, but of course, then you have to also collaborate with like um, voice actors and um, with someone that actually translate our work um, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Also with someone that kind of um, sees if it's still like um, yeah touching like the things that we find important in our work mm -hmm. yeah and I think it, it, it was um, interesting for me because my Dutch is quite at a low level sort of <laughs> no. I, I, I wrote this uh, English script with Anna and then it went to Dutch mm -hmm. and it was recorded in Dutch. And then the final project, yeah, I'm sort of removed from in a way. And you, you, it's, yeah, my name's under the project, but you can't like 100% fully appreciate the end project, which is this kind of strange mm -hmm. feeling. You've got to have this trust in, yeah, in the other partner in, in this instance. But if, if we were to do it in a language that's neither of our mother tongues, then it, you yeah, you're going a step further away from having um, full control, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. but, um, uh -huh. but I think something we also thought about was it could also be um, maybe a monologue as well. So it's less yeah. of a conversation. Maybe it's a shorter monologue. Mm -hmm. And I think that could be easier to actually mm -hmm. then translate and record without actually having to, yeah, I think that's more manageable to do. But it's, 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 it's something you don't have to worry about with, yeah, visual arts. It's, well, it's also yeah, it's, right to work with like a collaborate with like other people again, which is also a nice thing. What we also really um, like. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Exactly. I, I think that's it. Also brings me to the next question uh, about uh, the importance of language in your work, because um, starting from sound and doing. Um, sound works and and recordings um it could i mean it's a kind of an open field and it is nice it you you did a really wonderful job and it's uh, it's really so enjoyable it's just um if language is uh, not accessible so is uh, the idea of of using uh, another sound is that uh, something you you had in your concept or where you uh, always are really linking on, uh, on on language at all. So that's yeah. I think for this project, we we did like language was quite 
um, central. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, yeah, think, yeah. That, yeah, there's, there's lots of ways that, that plants communicate. You know, artists before have linked up microphones and you can hear a plant's actual sounds of when they're, they're sucking up water. You can hear the bubbles going through the tree, for example, and, you know, that's a sound mm, yeah, that yeah, yeah. anyone can appreciate. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's not quite, um, yeah, ticking the boxes that we wanted to tick in, that we wanted to approach, yeah, these issues that are complex to a point where you do need language. Mm. So, yeah, it, it does put you in a spot where it, it's a bit limited with your audiences, but I think another way to get around it is to, um, yeah, perhaps have a script that goes with your work and then maybe the, the work's in, in English, but you can then easily translate the script um, in a variety of different languages so you can maybe follow along or things like that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Also, wonderful. Yeah, it's also the soundscape for us. Uh, for the project in Barcelona, for example, we only like try to tell um, a certain story with like sound. So the soundscapes, um, like uh, for example, when we add, come to sites, I think it's important to record as many sounds uh, as we can find that are typical for that area so that we still can make really a site-specific work because uh, when you're also somewhere else you kind of recognize um, that city mm -hmm. I think that's um, really a big part of our work that's that we have the mm -hmm. sound that is really responding to the environment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah thank you that was my question and um, hopefully someone else is joining <laughs> Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah. Yeah, if anyone else has a question, fire, fire away. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I, I was wondering about how you chose like uh, gender identity or non-human uh, objects. Thought that was interesting, and also like the names, like how you came up with that. Yeah, yeah, we do, we do get asked this a lot. Like, yeah, why, why those names? Um, yeah, we didn't really have a good solution for what what to name a character at, at the start. We we thought at the start maybe we can research into local um, history and maybe find some names in the history that are really important to that area, and then pin them to. Uh, yeah, the characters, but in the end, we actually just went with the names of the the voice actors that we worked with. Um, and so then, yeah, it, it maybe helped with our recording as well in that mm -hmm. we tried to, we'd met our voice actors before we wrote the script, and so we tried to write the script in a way that would actually um, match the character um, of the voice actor. And so by calling them their name, we, we tried to make it as natural as possible um, as well and then yeah gender I think yeah that's something we discussed as well like like the the thing is we're talking to the, the other than human but we're pinning so many human concepts onto the character so yeah there's this this um, contradiction there but I I think we were just trying often to surprise uh yeah surprise the listener in a way I think when I think of a, a mole I think of like an older man who's a bit grumpy and a bit dopey. And so for our character, we decided to get a younger female character that was like quite enthusiastic and kind of snappy and, mm -hmm. and sort of upset that expectation. And so... Um, to really step away from like the cartoons that are made, for example. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think, yeah, gender, it, there's no... Yeah, I, I think it just naturally we just went, oh, this might work more as a... A female or a male voice but I think maybe in the future it's something to explore more to even be a bit more ambiguous about it um, and yeah that's, that's a good question though. Thanks. Hopefully we answered it. <laughs> yeah yeah thank you. Cool. Are there any other questions for our fabulous artists? Oh, 
Okay. Well, thank you, thank you so much, you two, for being a part of this and sharing your work with us and for being open and considerate with your, your answers and questions. And um, yeah. Thank you for the talk, for your presentation. Yeah, no worries at all. Um, yeah, I'm sure you can find our website somewhere and we'd love it. Yeah, we've talked so much about our characters, but we'd love it if over the next weeks or months or years, decades, you can uh, just yeah take the time to listen. And if you have some feedback, we'd really like to hear it because, um, yeah, you know, we spend so long making these and it's, it's so nice to actually hear people's responses to them. So um, we'd love to hear some feedback if you eventually do listen to them. Yeah, and thanks for coming uh, today. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much. And for the invitation, of course. Yeah. Yeah, have a good time and hope to see you again soon yeah. in, in, in reality. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that'd be also. great. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Good, goodbye. Right. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Thanks for coming. Have a good evening. Enjoy your Friday. Ciao. Stay safe. Stay safe. Cheers. Thank you.